Today, we are dissecting the messy wiggetry at Vogue Japan, falling into a purple haze with Dazed, and witnessing Vogue France's foray in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. My name is Marco, welcome to The Model Gene, and all I want for Christmas is beautiful fashion imagery, but let's see if the Grinch had another thing planned this month. We are about to embark on a visual sleigh ride across the glossy covers of the most iconic fashion bibles, so put on your boxing gloves, hit that like button, and let's get started on December's Battle of the Covers. Nicki Minaj covers Vogue US for the first time in a very classic, traditional photo. Scanning the photo from top to bottom, I don't see anything out of place. This Valentino dress is reflecting the light in a beautiful way. The folds provide movement, but are not distracting. Her skin is glowing with this very restrained retouching, which I appreciate greatly. If I were to change anything about this cover, it would be to insert a bit more edge and fire into the image. Nicki Minaj is known for breaking boundaries and being bold in all of her choices, so I would have appreciated something to subvert this image, even if it was as small as swapping out these Irene Neuwirth earrings with something more sculptural and modern. Emily Ratajkowski is on the cover of Vogue Australia, shot by Lachlan Bailey, and although it is another beigey beige photo like last month's Vogue France cover of Victoria Beckham, I much prefer this cover. Emily looks fresh-faced and dewy, and I think this is one of the better covers of her career. Some faces can handle a lot of makeup, but I think less is more when shooting her. British Vogue's December covers by Tim Walker are a flop, despite some very compelling subjects. The best cover is of Stormzy, although it is surprising to see him on a solo cover after how Edward Enenful overhyped Timothy Chalamet's groundbreaking cover for October last year. It is hard enough getting a model on a Vogue cover, so now male celebrities getting solo covers is going to make things even worse. This cover would be fine for GQ, but is too boring for Vogue. The all-white looks would have been more enjoyable with a different background, but they all feel so stark and lifeless, even when some of the subjects are trying to push through by over-emoting. The worst cover is of Kate Moss and the nepotismist Nepo model of all time, but I'm sure this is only the first of many British Vogue covers for Lila, unfortunately. Harper's Bazaar España's covers can be split into those with and without strong art direction. Let's start with Marissa Berenson in Scaparelli. For those of you who may not know, Marissa is the granddaughter of Elsa Scaparelli and was scouted by Diana Vreeland at a party in New York City, much to the chagrin of her grandmother. Elsa and Diana were close friends before, but after Marissa appeared in the first ever nude shoot in Vogue for their April 1970 issue, Elsa was livid and would not forgive Diana for it. This black and white hood is a very easy choice for the cover. The silhouette naturally lends itself to a strong portrait. Rosy de Palma's cover with the dove is unfortunate in the timing after Vogue España had Rosalia on their cover last month with two doves. I don't think it's a bad cover, but I would have changed a few things. My biggest issue with the cover is the amount of her face that is being obscured, especially since her nose is her most defining feature, and I would have lowered the bird to where it was aligned with her other eye. Eva Longoria also has a nice cover, with the lines of her dress encouraging your eye to move around the image. India Moore's cover is a nice portrait, but I don't think the neck up is matching the neck down. From the neck up, we have glamour, but this wrinkled sheer fabric feels cheap. Elle McPherson's cover is easily the worst of the covers. This outfit is appropriate for a rich mom going to Whole Foods, but not for a magazine cover, and the energy of her face is not matched in her body. Juana Martin's cover is not strong enough for a fashion magazine, but works for an image for a news interview buried in the pages of a magazine. Forget what I said about Elle McPherson's cover, now this is the worst of the covers. Alexia looks terrified. Her body language is also very contracted and uncomfortable. Finally, Alexa Chung's cover is fine, the red pops nicely, and my favorite part is actually how wild her shadow looks. I only have one thing I would change for this cover of Vogue Germany, and that is the silver makeup above Greta Hoffer's eyebrows. I think they were trying to echo the sheen of her outfit, but I would have preferred nothing or a gold above the brow. But I like the composition, the hair, the art direction. Leah Cabede by Campbell Addy for Vogue Italia is a waste of a gorgeous model and a disappointing way to end the year for them. My eye immediately goes to the reflection of the sphere she is holding in front of her, and it is difficult to look at anything else when all the visual energy is going there, especially in the sea of Red. None of the other photos from the editorial stand out as a viable cover option, but if I had to pick one favorite, it would be this black and white image. With Harper's Bazaar Italia's cover by Melanie and Ramon, it just looks like a model against a wall instead of utilizing the obvious nautical theme of this neoprene look as part of the visual narrative. 
There are also two things that really bother me about this title. The first being the pure black color of the font next to the color graded black that has been made blue. Secondly, my eye immediately jumps to the serif of the Z because it looks like it is part of Valentina's shadow. This is not a terrible image, but the styling should really be a key storytelling ingredient. Vogue France heads to the Centre Pompidou for their December issue, and we are once again let down by the styling on this cover in this custom Louis Vuitton look, which very clearly the brand paid to be on. Vogue France's Instagram page explains that the fabrication of the cape is a collaboration with the artist Philippe Barreno, a mix of concrete tiles and fiber optics to look like a tweet and there is an eight page spread about this in the magazine. But that does not excuse these white tights, these shoes, the way the rope is tied around Ida. Um, they're, they're Louis Vuitton shoes, you know? Well, it's, you know, even Louis Vuitton makes mistakes. This superhero, this super villain look aside, I actually love this editorial and think Theo did a fantastic job in utilizing the Centre Pompidou without overwhelming the subject. My favorite is this photo in the Raban dress, which I would have loved for the cover, but the rest of the looks are great, besides the other Louis Vuitton one. Did you notice how stylist Robbie Spencer used these same Bottega Veneta silver mules in multiple looks? Harper's Bazaar France has this horrible cover of Charles de Gainsbourg, and this surprisingly not so horrible cover of Loli Bahia by Jürgen Teller. To be honest, when the hair, makeup, styling, and model are great, you are already halfway to a successful image. So this cover works in the same way that his Celine campaigns with Daria Verbovi did. However, inside the magazine, Karim sadly shot the main fashion story with Loli, and this image should have been a cover. And if it was, it would have been my favorite cover of the month. Instead, we got this. Vogue Portugal's covers are themed on love and hope for their December issue, and they are my least favorite from Vogue Portugal of the year, although the bar has been set very high. This cover of Sia and Iljima is nice, visually very straightforward, but I would have never guessed this was a December cover from looking at it. Branislav Shimonchik's cover of Alessia Merzlova is fine. The plants are definitely the highlight, but it is hard to connect with the cover when the model's eyes are closed and we have no fashion to latch onto. The lack of interesting fashion on the cover is more of a through line than love and hope, because these other two covers are equally unimpressive. Vogue Japan's December issue is a waste of two beautiful models. The most distracting element of the photo is these cheap wigs. Photographers tend to find a team of people that they work with and use them for everything, but perhaps if you are shooting two South Sudanese models, your Ukrainian hairstylist is not going to be the best fit for the job. Wigs aside, this majority white background with a bit of color at the bottom is throwing me off. I much prefer this alternate photo for a cover, where the screens inject some geometry and color with more balanced visual weight. Vogue China has several strong covers for December, although this group shot feels very unbalanced with the excess of negative of space. Even if the photo was cropped in just a little, I think it would have been much more successful. Of the solo covers, this pink and plume one is my favorite. Even with how feminine the clothes are, the model still looks cool and strong, and the colors look great together. 10 Plus Magazine's jewelry cover is just another photo in a long list where the photographers are using dark-skinned African models as black backdrops. Look at how all color and dimension have been removed from her skin, and how different it is to what she actually looks like. Be sure to stay tuned for my video on colorism in the modeling industry, and another on the disturbing trend of scouting at refugee camps. Dazed Magazine's cover of Anakiai is another triumph by Caroline Jacobs and is my favorite cover of the month. Using colored powder isn't new. Here is another use of it from Vogue Netherlands from this shoot in 2012, but the mood here is entirely different with Anak. There are so many interesting compositional elements here, like the triangular shape of her wig and how her long neck breaks up that volume. Her crossed leg is also adding more movement to the photo. It's all a pleasure to look at and makes me want to see more. Metal Magazine has a couple of unremarkable covers, but also one I think is fantastic. Angie Couples Leve cover has such visual balance, I really have nothing negative to say about the image. Even the skin of the models is mirroring the rubbery poly pocket texture of the garments. I think it was also very smart to have Christine looking at Thule rather than at the camera, because now there seems to be more of a backstory to their interaction, adding a little bit of intrigue. Two thumbs up for Metal Magazine. Numero Netherlands is a mixed bag with their covers. I love Jessica Stam's cover. It is moody and mysterious. This wig is a great match with the makeup. Tens across the board. Raya's cover is also a success, and you can tell that they really thought about creating a striking image before they even got on set. It does remind me of the Vogue Italia cover of Angelina Kendall from September, but I still like a lot of what they did here, like the textured background with the pleated top in contrast to how sleek everything is with the white background. Laomi's cover is disappointing. The red background is so high energy, but that energy is not matched in her pose or face. 
The cover of Dalton Dubois is a reference to Irving Penn's corner portraits that force your perspective onto the subject, and I was struggling to pinpoint exactly what it is that makes me not love this cover. I think the hair braid, which it seems they were trying to mimic the stem of the cherry, should have been at the top of her head, and a glossy lip would have been nice. It's not a terrible cover, it's fine, I won't remember it next month. Now to the boys of Numero Netherlands. This cover of Marlon Teixeira is the best of the bunch, although a couple of necklaces and some fabric around the waist make it difficult to call it a fashion shoot. The rest of the inside story is much of the same. Not a fan of Jordan Barrett's cover, but a lot of photographers struggle with his facial proportions, and that is why most shoot him from three-quarter profile with half his face hidden in strong shadow. I really dislike this last cover. My eyes go directly to his nostrils, his eyes are too dark to make a connection with, and this brown leather jacket is too big for him. The Perfect Man magazine has two covers of Michael Oden by Ilya Okar, both very bold and compelling covers. The angles of Michael's face are allowed to take center stage, and the styling elements are not overwhelming the images. SA magazine's autumn winter cover of Joseph Uitehova shows how a hairstylist can really make or break an image. This would be a beautiful but boring cover if the model had a traditional side parted and slicked hairstyle, but here we have the energy being twisted around, being pulled forward and then back again. Conflict can be good in an image, and I think that is what makes this such a great cover, and my favorite of the 11 covers for this issue, definitely the best men's cover of the month. Arena On Plus is so unmistakably British that even if many of the covers are throwaways, I can at least appreciate that the magazine has a clear identity. The magazine comes out bi-annually, so I can forgive the excess of covers, but I do find the three Jack Grealish covers a bit confusing. In this one, I would have no clue that it was Jack if not for the caption. I think the more zoomed out portrait does the best at capturing the footballer. It has the most personality that he is famous for in comparison to the close-up that is too serious. There are also a few covers by Sean and Sang of the actors who played Prince William and Harry in the final season of The Crown. This one is definitely my favorite. The balance of the colors is very pleasant, but his spiky hair still feels a bit punk, and I like an expressive face for a cover. Man About Town has 11 covers for their autumn winter issue, and a few of them stood out. I cannot believe that Mariano Vivanco shot this cover of German actor Louis Hoffman. Every part of the photo is a mess. The retouching on his skin makes him look like he rubbed his face with soot. The styling is busy, sloppy, very unappealing for a cover. I'm just very surprised seeing this, knowing what Mariano is capable of. Speaking of sloppy, look at William Franklin Miller's black boxer shorts peeking out here. Stylist Damien Fox is the editor-in-chief of Man About Town, and I've noticed that his styling is often the kiss of death to a good editorial. And that is where today's review is going to end. But for more about the fashion industry, check out the links below. Let me know in the comments what you thought about the covers this month, and be sure to subscribe to find out who comes out on top next month in the battle of the covers.